You all know what this is? Passport? So I can get out of my state? Like if I'm going to go to Pennsylvania? You know, sometimes I think to go to like Long Island to see Valerie, I do need one of these. Here, can you read what that says there? Um, hold on, let me get the mic for you. You know, just so Isabel can hear you. Yep. The Secretary of State of the United States of America hereby requests all whom it may concern to permit the citizen national, national of the United States named herein to pass without delay or hindrance in case, and in case of need to give all li lawful aid and protection. Pretty powerful statement right there, isn't it? I tell you what. Here. What's that say? Do you know who that is? <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> Back when I had hair that long, <laughs> I thought to myself, wow, the Secretary of State of the United States of America demands that anywhere I go, any country I go to, that I pass without hindrance or delay and that that nation offers me all lawful aid in case of emergency. That just made my confidence soar when I went over to Germany, which is why I got this originally. I felt like, whoa, I belong here. I, 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 am, I am entitled to be here because of the authority that backs up those words, the Secretary of State of the United States of America. And, you know, in here it's got some information about me, it's got some information about uh, our country, it's got pictures of uh, the Rocky Mountains, New York City, uh, the, the Mount Rushmore, um, our colonies in outer space, um, all those great things uh, that have to do with our country, our power, our sovereignty, and, um, you know, I, I look at this thing, and it's pretty little, but it contains a lot, doesn't it? Well, before I, before I ever got this, I was given another passport. You see, they're kind of the same color, right? But this one's a lot bigger. This, here, you know what this is, right? It's a Bible. It's also our passport. It contains information about us, though much more, and on a much more personal nature. It doesn't have our name, but it has information about us. And ultimately, it does name us children of God. There is an authority behind this passport here that gives us uh, not just permission, but the command to go into all the earth, everywhere, through other sovereign nations and territories for a particular mission. Not all, this, this doesn't give us a mission. This, this says we can go for whatever. We can go for business. We can go for tourism. We can go to visit people. Uh, we can go to consider citizenship in those other countries. But this gives us a particular job to do wherever we go. We're not just called there to, to be there and take up space. We're called to go into the other nations of the world. We're called to cross the street in our own neighborhood even to proclaim the sovereignty of of Jesus Christ and all the good news that that brings with it. So, someday, you girls might get a little passport like this, but remember, you've already got a big passport right here and the command and the authority to go into other nations to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you like to pray for us? Of course you would. I'll, I will not hinder you or delay you, and in fact, I'll give you all lawful aid to pray for us, girl. Go for it. Take it away. Dear Lord, thank you for everything that you give us. Thank you for the stuff that you help us with and everything that we need. Amen. Amen. All right. Our gospel today comes from John chapter 18, and our other scripture reading comes from Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. 
It reads, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and on his account all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And from John chapter 18, verses 33 through 37 and maybe 38. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and your chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord God Almighty, I pray that you would take these words that we have heard and make them flesh in us by transforming our actions, our thoughts, and our prayers. Give us conviction of our sin and all confidence and assurance of salvation in turning to you through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So it's quite a lengthy introduction um, from John to the seven churches in Asia. And uh, the first question that should come to our mind when opening this letter and reading it is, why on earth did John write this 22-chapter letter to these seven churches and for us? Well, one, he, showed, he, wrote, the, he wrote this letter to show what must soon take place. These seven churches in Asia, and indeed our church today, is sitting in expectation of what is going to happen between now and when Christ returns to establish his kingdom here on earth as in heaven. Because it just seems like there is a lot up in the air right now. There's a lot of uncertainty how is this going to happen when it looks like there's all these kings and rulers and governors and principalities weighing down on us? There were Roman governors, even the Roman emperor himself, and even people within the churches of these seven churches of Asia that were seeking to undermine the authority of God and, and erase the influence of the church in the world around it. Sounds like trouble, right, girls? What are we going to do? Well, John writes this letter 
to alleviate those worries. He tells us about Jesus. He reminds us of who he is. He says that Jesus is the one that was. He existed before any of these kings and rulers and principalities in the world existed. He is the one who is. That means he exists right now. He reigns from heaven. And he is the one who is yet to come. So he is also on his way. And he says, Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Is that not a comfort to us in the church? Knowing that Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth? Hey, Ray, good morning. Jesus rules me. Jesus rules the president of the United States. He even rules the secretary of state of the United States. Jesus is the authority over and above all other authorities on earth. Jesus rules your parents, who are probably really big authorities over you right now, and rightfully so. What does this tell us that Jesus is the ruler over the kings of the earth? It tells us that, that the rulers under him derive their authority from him, so far as it is legitimate authority. That means they have the right to rule on his behalf. And if they're not ruling on his behalf, if their rule is contrary or contradictory to the word and rule of God, they're not really legitimate authorities, right? So Jesus, being the ruler and kings of the earth, gives us assurance that uh, legit, it, it shows us what legitimate authority looks like. It's authority that looks like the rule and authority of Christ himself. But these are fighting words to Rome, its governors, and even the rulers and authorities today that oppose the rule of Jesus Christ. They're fighting words. They stir up hostility. They create friction and tension, disunity, lack of peace, impurity and corruption, Everywhere that people seek to rule, counter to the kingdom of God. Counter to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. But he reminds us also in this letter that though we were once under the tyranny of an even greater ruler than the rulers of this earth, like Caesar and the governors, see you girls. <laughs> He reminds us that there was an even greater ruler over these other rulers. That is sin, namely. Sin was ruling these rulers. Sin was ruling uh, us. Sin was, sin was basically running the show here on earth until Jesus liberated us from sin by his blood. That's what he reminds us of here. So, one, Jesus is the ruler of the rulers of the earth, and he has also freed us from the illegitimate rulers of the earth. So, what are the implications of this lordship, kingship of Jesus Christ? Last week, one of the implications from our reading of Hebrews was that we have confidence to draw near to God through the blood of Christ. Through the work of Christ, we have confidence to draw near to God. The implication we should have from this this week about um, Jesus liberating us from the illegitimate rulers of the world and being the ruler of legitimate rulers of the world is that we should have confidence to go into all the territories of the earth that Christ has claimed as his own, and that's everything. When Christ returns, there is not going to be a square inch of our lives or of this earth over which he does not say, mine, 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 mine. It's all mine. It's always been mine. It is mine, and it always shall be mine. He has supreme authority over all of that. And so we can have confidence when he tells us to go into the world and spread the gospel to the ends of the earth to make disciples of every nation. We have confidence that that authority is coming from him, the rightful and legitimate authority to send us 
and that we are to be received in all of those places to which we are sent. I think there is an interesting comparison of of authority here from what we have in our gospel reading according to John this morning and the reading we have from uh, John's revelation that was given to him by Jesus in the, uh, in the other letter that we read this morning. In the gospel according to John, it might be easy to say, well, this kingdom of Jesus is completely otherworldly. It's spiritual. It's, it doesn't have anything to do with the concrete and material world in which we live. My kingdom is not from this earth, he says to Pilate. But you see, there's some real tension in what he's saying there. Because Pilate is making a comparison between his authority and the authority of the Jews that have handed Jesus over to him. He's telling Jesus, my authority doesn't come from Jerusalem. My authority comes from Rome. And the authority here in Jerusalem is subject to me. That's why they can't execute them. That's why they can't execute you themselves. They have sent you to me because I am the authority of this land. I have come from Rome. My authority is legitimate because Caesar has the might and right to make it so. And Jesus says, well, my authority is not of anywhere on this earth. My authority is not derived from anywhere on this earth. Actually, it comes from over and above this earth. My authority comes from heaven. And actually, as Revelation makes it clear, God intends to conquer and colonize this earth and rule it, just as Caesar sought to conquer and colonize the whole earth and make all of the earth, Rome, God, through Christ and his disciples and ambassadors in the church, is seeking to conquer and colonize the whole earth and make heaven and earth one. That's the mission. Very, very clearly, that is the mission. We are to make the earth the sovereign kingdom of God. We are to colonize the earth. This church here is not just an embassy of God's kingdom. We're not just ambassadors of God's kingdom. We're colonists. This is a colony of God's kingdom with authority derived from the highest authority, God. So Jesus is saying, my kingdom is not of this earth. My authority is not derived from the earth, but my authority on earth is derived from heaven. You say rightly that I am a king, he says to Pilate. For this reason I have come, and it is to this that I testify. Anyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And we can make the comparison between uh, Jesus' authority and the authorities of our world today. Um... Donald Trump might say, who are you to be ruler over me? I have my authority invested in me by the election of citizens of a sovereign nation. I am inaugurated and installed by the constitutional authority of the country of the United States of America. And Jesus might say to him, well, I have authority to rule over you because... I hold my office by God's election and by virtue of my resurrection from the dead, my ascension and installation at the right hand of God with all authority in heaven and on earth invested into me. Indeed, God gave Jesus a name that is above all names. That is why the rest of John's letter refers to Jesus as the king of kings. The ruler of the kings of the earth is the king above all kings. Because in that statement, we've got, in, in, Jesus, in, in Jesus establishing his legitimacy of authority, by virtue of his resurrection from the dead, he has shown that the greatest weapon of the kings and rulers of this earth, their greatest weapon, death, has been defeated, has been undermined. The greatest exertion of power that, that, 
executes law and justice in our land is, is the point of a gun, really. Uh, don't pay your taxes? Guess what? You're going to jail. You don't want to go to jail? They're going to send armed people to take you there. You put up a fight, they're going to shoot you. Simple as that. Every rule on the book is at some point enforced at the point of a gun. It's enforced at the point of death. Jesus has overcome death. He's completely overthrown the means by which the authorities of the earth hold their power. It's been overcome. Death is only a problem for three days. If we really believe that Christ rose from the dead, then death is not a weapon that has any effect on us. It holds no authority over us. We've been freed from the sting of death. We've been freed from the tyranny of sin by his blood. So, the implications of this are, as I've already said, Jesus' kingdom is not just spiritual. It's not just heavenly. It's also earthly. It's not of the earth, but it is intent on conquering and colonizing the earth. The second implication is that we can have confidence anywhere we go when we are sent and called by God on mission anywhere in the world. We can't say to ourselves, well, you know, I don't think I should be in Germany, Uganda, Israel, Palestine, or any other places, or Long Island, anywhere that we think we may need one of these things to go, we have authority from God in our passports, the Bible, to go there and be on mission. Now, we don't have the authority to go there and uh, misrepresent God, act like hooligans or, or um, disrespect uh, the people or culture or, or even conquer those people in the name of some other nation, but we have authority by God to use the sword of the spirit, that is of truth of scripture, to conquer the world and convert and, and transform people by the power of God's word that we carry with us to those places. I don't know what happened to it, but there was a, a poster in the, um, in the living room on the bulletin, on our missions bulletin, that, that had a request to pray for the, the 1040 zone uh, in the, or is it 1140? Nancy, do you know anything about that? The 1040 zone, uh, between, between 10 and 40 degrees uh, latitude on the earth, which cuts through the Sahara, the Middle East, and uh, Eastern Asia, in that area of the world is the least evangelized part of the world. It It's illegal. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. They won't they won't let you in. They'll cut your head off in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. It seems like the powers of this world forbid that mission to take place in those, those parts of the world. And it, it asks, um, the poster asked us to pray at 1040 every day for those areas and for missionaries that are in those places against the authority and rules and laws of the land. Christians are doing illegal things. Illegal things. And I think that's where we have to remember that legal and illegal don't imply right or wrong. They are an appeal to authority. And we need to ask ourselves, what authority are they appealing to when they state legal or illegal? Right or wrong come from God. Legal or, or illegal come from our conventions and legislations. They can be right or wrong. Remember, the Holocaust was perfectly legal in Germany. It doesn't make it right. Anyone with a conscience cultivated by God should know that's wrong. Anyone with a conscience cultivated by God should know it's wrong 
to behead Christians in those parts of the world. The 1040 zone. But we can have confidence to go where we are sent. If not to one of those places in the world, we can certainly have confidence to cross the street, to speak to our neighbor. We can have confidence to go down the road and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere we go in every corner of our lives. The third implication of this, um, of this passage here is that Jesus is ultimately positioned to win. He is positioned to win. He has already undermined the greatest weapon of the world, which is death. Spent by citizens of God's kingdom is ever spent in vain. You hear that? No effort that we spend to advance the kingdom of God is ever in vain. It's not wasted. Have any of you heard of John Allen Chow? John Allen Chow. My Thanksgiving was interrupted with um, tragic news of this young man. He was 28. He was from Washington State. He went to Oral Roberts University in Oklahoma. He was an accomplished missionary in South Africa. He was an accomplished missionary in Iran. He spoke four languages. Uh, he just it made me say, what on earth have I done with my life? <laughs> my goodness, he's accomplished more at 28 than, than I have in my advanced years. And uh, I heard that Wednesday he was shot dead with arrows on North Sentinel Island in the Indian Ocean. Um, now, North Sentinel Island is a, is a place that's fascinated me for years. It's, uh, I first learned about it from my Indian physics professor in college, and uh, I, I looked into it, and it's a place that's been completely cut off from contact from the rest of the world for like 10,000 years or something like that. The British took two six captives and returned four back in like the 1800s or something like that. But since then, nobody has been to the island that hasn't been killed. Uh, it, it's, and, and for a good reason, for good reasons. The Indian government has made it illegal to go there. The Coast Guard patrols uh, 30 miles away from the island to make sure nobody gets to it. Um, anybody that's gone there has been killed by the natives. And, and it's a good idea to keep people away from there because we have really terrible diseases that don't affect us at all. If we so much as sneeze or cough on that island, it could kill everybody because they don't have immune systems that are developed like ours. It's alive. There's a good reason to prevent an exchange here at this point. We couldn't inoculate them with vaccines quick enough to save everybody. And so that, that island has been in isolation for a long time. And, um, and, and they, they've got a language that nobody knows, that nobody can speak. But John Allen Chow decided that he would go to that island to try and evangelize the people, the 15 people or so that are estimated to be on that island. Uh, many of the news articles I read tried to make him out to be some crazy religious fanatic by quoting excerpts from his diary out of context, which I think is just terribly wrong. Um, but one of the things that, that was clear to me is that he was of sound mind. He knew exactly the risk that he was getting into and accepted the risk and, and was intent on accomplishing a goal to advance the kingdom of God. He wasn't crazy. He accomplished a lot. In 28 years of his life, he, he learned four languages. He, he was a missionary in at least two other countries. He led rescue missions and firefighting efforts in the Cascade Mountains in northwestern United States. Um, and he was called by God to evangelize to these people on an island that hasn't been contacted in hundreds of years. And he was shot first through his waterproof Bible and then 
through the rest of his body. He was dragged through the beach and buried on the beach by the natives. Um, and I, I wonder, was, was his death in vain? Was, his, was it absolutely pointless to do what he did? And uh, I don't know what God has in store for the people of North Sentinel Island, um, but I know that that effort wasn't in vain. I know that his death is only a problem at most for three days. I know that the authority that they exercised in killing him is not the final word for John Allen Chow. And I am inspired by the confidence that he had in going to that island. I, I, and I say, I'm, many, many of you are maybe thinking, oh wow, we can't wait till Kyle goes off to that North Sentinel Island. <laughs> but, but if I don't go there, I know that I should be at least as confident as him when I am participating in mission right here in this church, when I am participating in mission right here in Herkimer, in New York, and anywhere else I go to the ends of the earth. We can have confidence like that. If there was anything that, that underlied the, the statements from his diary that you can read online, it's confidence in the victory of Christ. It's confidence in the mission and legitimacy of the mission of Christ, the authority to go into the world and make disciples of all nations. And if that's not a cause you can give your life to, I'd ask you to consider your own call, what you are willing to give your life for. Consider that many other people have given and risked their lives for causes and rulers more temporary than Jesus Christ. Many have given their lives for rulers and causes more temporary than Jesus Christ. Is that, is he not a king you can give your life to? As I said, we may not all be called to places like John Allen Chow in North Sentinel Island, but we are called to have that same confidence wherever we're called because Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. And so it's because of that assurance that we can open a letter like this with grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ and close it. If you skip through, if you like to cheat and go to the last chapter of this book, he closes it with grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so everything from beginning to end is filled with nothing short of the whole totality of the rule and reign and grace of Jesus Christ. So grace and peace to you. Let us pray. Oh Lord God Almighty, we do pray to increase our confidence that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and give us, give us a double portion of the confidence that you placed in your servant, John Allen Chow. We pray for the people involved with getting him to that island who have been arrested, and we pray that you would be merciful to them in their sentencing, that you would free them and liberate them. And for the family of John Allen Chow, we pray that your peace would be with them, that the peace you've already demonstrated in them with their ability to forgive his killers, uh, that you would use them to continue the powerful witness you started. And for everything that may happen as a result of this in the years to come, we pray that uh, you would demonstrate to us that no effort, no effort so far has been in vain, but all of it is going to be leading up to the glorification of your son, Jesus Christ. Even so, we pray that that confidence would be placed in us, that we would be powerful, confident witnesses right here in this church, right here in Herkimer, and to everywhere you may call us or send us. We pray in Jesus' name, our Lord of lords and King of kings. Amen.